Fairest Lord Jesus, Ruler of all nature, O Thou of God and man, the Son, Thee will I cherish. soul's glory, joy, and crown. Fair are the meadows, fairer still the woodlands, robed in the Jesus is fairer, Jesus is purer, who makes the woeful heart to see. Fair is the sunshine, fairer still the twinkling starry walls. Jesus shines brighter, Jesus shines purer than all the angels have can Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son of Man, glory and honor, praise and now and forevermore be thine. All right. Good morning again. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to Advanced Bible Course 203. Today, as we get into the lesson, we're looking at the mission of the church. Very important subject. Uh, sometimes we get sidetracked from the main purpose of the church, its mission. Uh, and again, I've got the wrong name up there, but this should be about the mission of uh, the church. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 24, verses 45 to 47, Luke tells us, and he, that is Christ, opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. While the church may be engaged in many things which have a positive nature to the gospel of Christ, we need to understand that the mission of the church is so that repentance and remission of sins can be and should be preached among all nations and that was to begin at Jerusalem. When we talk about the mission of the church, we can't help but 
think of what we call the Great Commission, which guides us in this purpose or mission. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. When we look at this, the church understands, the religious world understands, uh, in a heading even in this section in my Bible, it says the Great Commission. Not a commission or one of the commissions, but it is the Great Commission. This implies that that is the primary mission and committing that mission to the church. I don't want to get overly simple here, but I want us to understand when we talk about a commission, we are talking about an instruction, command, or duty given to a person or group of people. And so when Jesus taught his disciples to go into all the world, preaching and teaching the gospel, he was giving an instruction, a command, showing us our duty or responsibility. And as a group of people, as we've seen, the church is a group of people called out of the world. And so again, as the commission, it sometimes is also referred to as a group of people officially charged uh, with a particular function. And so the church is a commission of Christ to preach and teach the gospel. What is the mission of the church? When Jesus was on earth in Luke 19 verse 10, he said, for the Son of Man has come, to seek and to save that which is lost or that which was lost. Jesus on earth came to seek and to save. And of course, as we've seen in our text from the book of Luke chapter 24, it was written, it was prophesied in the scriptures that Jesus would suffer for our sins, that he would die, be buried, and resurrect on the third day. And so as Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost, the Great Commission giving to the church, expressing the mission of the church, the primary mission is to continue what Jesus was doing, seeking and saving the lost. If, uh, as we talk about the mission of the church, uh, what Jesus' primary mission was not, as we look, Jesus did not come to this earth to end sickness, for sickness still exists. He did not come to end poverty, for poverty still exists. He did not come to end widowhood or orphans. He did not come to end hunger or nakedness. If he come to end these things, then the church and Christ has made a very small impact on the world in general. But this is not what Jesus' primary mission was. His mission was to seek and to save that which is lost. The church has a primary mission to the souls 
of mankind. The church must know its primary mission or else it gets lost. Early on, Jesus told his disciples in Acts 1.8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So when we talk about the mission of the church, first and foremost, it must be to preach and to teach the gospel of Christ. And in order to do that, the church must provide preachers and teachers. That is, we must educate them, and that's what we're attempting to do today and through Christ Way Bible Institute, as well as other schools of preaching and teaching. The mission of the church in keeping with this is to provide preachers and teachers, to provide for them financially, and the church should direct the worship of God it is the mission of the church to edify or to build up the body of Christ, to provide the things necessary for the worship of God, and to show charity, love in all things. And so we're going to spend some time this morning looking at uh, these seven principles as they apply in the scriptures. To preach and to teach the gospel, which was to begin in Jerusalem and to go into all the world. That is our primary mission. That is the mission of the church. Everything else should be done to facilitate this primary or priority in the mission of the church. In Galatians 1.8, Paul says, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then that which you have received, let him be accursed. The principle, the priority, is to preach and teach the gospel of Christ, seeking and saving that which is lost. Some churches have created uh, a different set of gospels. They have, again, established social gospels. They have attempted to do and to teach uh, many things as the mission of the church. But we are charged to preach and to teach the gospel. And if we preach and teach any other gospel than that which we see that the early church was engaged in, we are exposing ourselves to being accursed. Jesus said, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. The example that we have as far as the mission of the church in seeking and saving that which is lost are these two ideas. Start where you are. The disciples were in Jerusalem. Jesus intended for the gospel to go to the end of the earth, everywhere, to all people, all nations. But you can't go everywhere at the same time. Different people have different abilities. So start where you are and go where you can. Start where you are. Start first, of course, in your responsibility 
in being obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Deal with members of your family, your immediate family in your house, those of your house. And we see that in the book of Acts, where we see the household of Lydia. We see the household of Cornelius. We see the household of the, ju the jailer. Start where you are <clears throat> with yourself, with your family, and then go where you can whether that is in your neighborhood, whether that is in your town, or whether you have the ability to expand out into the world. But sadly, in time past, we've seen many people interested in going to the other side of the world to preach and teach the gospel of Christ, but they won't preach and teach where they are. And so the mission of the church is to start where you are and to go where you can, preaching, teaching the gospel of Christ, seeking and saving that which is lost. The other account of, or another account of the mission given to the church is found in Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. He said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. These three points, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and that is to every creature or all of creation. And so we can see in this verse, we can see in Matthew's verse, we can see in the statement given by Jesus in Acts 1, that the emphasis of the church is on preaching the gospel to every creature in all the world starting where we are and going to wherever and to as many as we can. As part of that, of keeping that mission of the church, the church has to be responsible for preparing and educating preachers and teachers for not only the local congregation, but also to be able to go into all the world. So we need preachers and teachers in the local church, and we need educated preachers and teachers to take on the mission that God has given to us. In keeping with the idea of providing, that is, educating preachers and teachers, notice what Paul says to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 2 and 1, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses Commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul refers to Timothy as my son. Well, he is not Paul's physical human son, and he is not his son in the sense that uh, Paul converted him to Christianity. He is Paul's son because the Apostle Paul took him <clears throat> under his wing and began to teach him uh, the things necessary to be strong in the grace of Jesus Christ. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses 
commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I don't know who is somebody have a question or what is the, the constant ding we're hearing here? Does someone have a question? Okay. And so again, in providing for preachers and teachers, Paul said, the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so we see this process in the mission of the church for providing preachers and teachers through education. The Apostle Paul was given the gospel by Jesus Christ. He took this young man as well as he did others, and he taught him, and he went with him, and he heard from him in the presence of many witnesses the things pertaining to the gospel of Christ and living a Christian life. And as Paul had committed himself to Timothy and others that they might be educated in the gospel of Christ, Paul encourages him likewise to take those same things of the gospel of Christ and commit these to faithful men who will in turn be able to teach others also. And so we have an unbroken chain. It is the duty and the responsibility of preachers and teachers to share what they know and to encourage others, other young men, other men to be preachers, and both men and women to be teachers in the appropriate ways of the church. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.16, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Part of that education is living a godly example before others. We're familiar with 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so the mission of the church is preaching and teaching the gospel of Christ. And to do that, we have to educate and prepare preachers and teachers of the gospel of Christ. And in so doing that, we have to also provide for those preachers and teachers. And in this sense, we're talking about financially, whether that is in food, clothing, shelter, or money or monetary means, uh, we have a responsibility if they're going to preach and they're going to teach, and that's going to take them away from a full-time job or to the extent that they are engaged in that, uh, again, we have to support. One of the great lessons that the church has missed is taking care of its preachers and teachers, uh, and that is not the responsibility of some organization uh, somewhere else, it is the responsibility of the local church to take care of its local preachers and teachers to see that they have the things they have need of, not what they want, but that they have need of. In Philippians 4.10 Paul says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly 
that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now what I speak in regard to me, not that I res- not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Apostle Paul speaks to the church at Philippi or Philippi concerning their care for him or their providing for him, either financially or in food or whatever that was. And he had received from them before, but they lacked opportunity. And Paul was glad to see that they had the ability to assist again. A church can and should assist as they can others who are preaching and teaching the Word of God. But we need to understand that part of the local congregation, the local church, is to take care of its preachers and teachers. When Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, he was addressing some issues that people had brought up concerning him receiving assistance financially or otherwise, from the church there uh, at Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians 9, 3, he says, My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? When someone becomes a preacher or a teacher, In the body of Christ, do they forego their right to eat and drink? Well, that's a crazy question because if they forego their right to eat and drink, they won't be preaching and teaching for very long. He says, do we have no right to take along a believing wife? Not only should we provide for the preacher and teachers, but also their wives and families if they are committed to and are following uh, the, uh, the great commission as it's given to us. And so Paul was asking concerning rights and, and to what extent should we help? Should we just take care of the preacher? Well, no, Paul says we have a right Uh, to take our families and to expect our families to be taken care of if they are taking care of the spiritual needs of the local congregation. They have a right then uh, to eat and to drink. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Preachers and teachers, if if they commit themselves full-time to the preaching, have a right to have the opportunity to not engage in physical work, and the church can support them. But understand what we're saying here. And this is another point that many have missed. We're talking about working full-time in the ministry, not just preaching once or twice or on Sunday. We're talking about every day of the week, out knocking on doors, out preaching and teaching the gospel continuously as if we were engaged in secular work. Many people believe that just because they preach and teach on Sunday, they don't ever have to do anything else Monday through Saturday, and that's ridiculous. 
if you're just going to preach and teach on Sunday and that's all you're going to do, go get a job. But if you're going to totally commit yourself to the things of God 24-7, then again, the church has a responsibility to assist you in that. And Paul asks a question, who goes toward his own expense? The government, the nation, supports its troops. Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? And he says, do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same thing also? For it's written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? And again, Deuteronomy 25, 4. Or does he say it all together for our sakes? And Paul says, for our sakes, no doubt, that is written that he who plows should plow in hope. No one plants a garden and prepares a garden without the hope of being able to share in the food of that garden. No one threshes on the threshing floor of wheat without any hope of receiving a portion of that. And so if we have sown spiritual things, uh, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? So again, the mission of the church is to preach and teach the gospel of Christ, that it is its primary mission. In order to do that, we educate preachers and teachers who can uh, take care of that responsibility. And if we're going to have full-time preachers and teachers, then we need to provide for them financially. And that's the responsibility of the local congregation, not that others cannot help, but the local congregation should live up to its responsibility to the evangelists and teachers and all of those who are working full time for the benefit of the local congregation. Another part of the mission of the church is to direct the worship of God the fellowship of the believers. In Acts 2, beginning in verse 42, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Praising God. Part of the mission of the church in our preaching and teaching of the gospel is to direct the believers in praising God in a way which is both reverend and respectful to the God of heaven. Jesus told the woman at the well of Samaria in John 4, beginning in 23, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. So how do we make sure that those who worship God do so in spirit and according to truth? Jesus had said in Matthew 5, 8, these people draw near to me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine.
doctrines, the commandments of men. It is the mission of the church to guide and direct the worship of God as the gospel, as the New Testament tells us. That worship should not be vain because we are following the commandments of men, but it should be reverend and accepted unto God because it is done in spirit and in truth, guided and directed by the church, and especially the preachers, teachers, and of course uh, the elders, the overseers of the churches which have them. Part of the uh, mission of the church that we're talking about is to edify the church. That is to build it up spiritually, numerically, and also individually uh, in knowledge and understanding of the truth. When one comes to Christ, when one is baptized into Christ, they are babes in Christ. They need to desire the sincere milk of the word that they might grow thereby. And it's the church's responsibility to build up, to educate, to strengthen these new converts. In Ephesians 4.11 it talks about the gifts in the early church God gave. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect or complete man to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. <clears throat> that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ. The mission of the church in preaching and teaching the gospel, seeking and saving the lost is once one has been converted to Christ, just as we guide and direct them in understanding what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth, we edify, strengthen, build up those individuals, not in the cunning craftiness and deceitfulness of the world, not in doctrines and commandments of men, but we continue to preach and teach the full gospel of Christ that we might reach the stature of the fullness of Christ. Christian means Christ-like, and it's the duty of the church to work with each individual Christian that they become the person Christ wants them to be. We have an example of Christ in edification, Romans 5, verse 1. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. We don't just want to build up ourselves, but part of edification is that we're not selfish, but we want to see our neighboring Christian, our brother and sister, in the body of Christ, become strong. It is a beautiful thing 
to watch someone who knows absolutely little about Christ to come to a saving knowledge of truth, to be baptized for the remission of their sins, to be born into the family of God and watch that individual grow and become strong in the things of the Word of God, to move from one being taught to one who now is able to be a teacher. It's such a beautiful thing, and this is the mission of the church, to seek and to save that which is lost and to edify and build up those who are a part of that body. It is the mission of the church to provide for the worship, that is, the necessary items. When someone comes to our congregation to worship God, they should not have to provide things necessary for the worship. That is the place the things necessary for the communion, a visitor should come and be able to participate in the worship. And this is what Paul did in Acts 20 and 7 as he was journeying on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, talking about the communion. Paul, ready to depart on the next day, spoke to them and continued his message into midnight. Paul was able to come into this city and on the first day of the week find out where the church was. He was able to go and worship. And not only was he able to worship, but he was able to participate uh, in that he uh, was a preacher and teacher uh, to those who were there that day. And so again, when it comes to the implements of worship, whatever the things are that we need, whether that's the place, the songbooks, whatever, the local congregation should have that prepared and ready wherever they meet so that the worship of God is not encumbered uh, with excessive burdens upon those who assemble on a regular basis at that place. In Philemon 1, verse 1, beginning Paul says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. And uh, he goes on to the beloved, Athea, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church, in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The house was not the church, but the church met in their house. And so whether it meets in someone's home or whether they have their own building or whatever it is, Again, there should be a place that is identified as the place to worship. That should be prepared and provided by the local congregation, however they're able to accomplish and accommodate that. And in all things, we should show charity or love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1, Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give all I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So again, as part of the mission of the church, we should show love one to another. 
Uh, we should show love to God. We should show love to our fellow man, love for the word of God. Uh, we express that love in our worship, in our teaching, our edification, our providing and caring for one another. Notice what Paul says in Galatians 6, 6 to the church. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. This is back talking about uh, providing for those who teach and preach the word of God. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he that sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, but in due, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. In the mission of the church, we should not grow weary. As we have opportunity, we should do good, especially to those of the household of faith. We should express our love, our care, our concern for them. We should bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. The mission of the church begins with the preaching and teaching of the gospel. We have to be able to prepare those to be able to preach and to teach, to support them in their work. And in so doing, preaching and teaching the word, we engage in the worship and service of God. And then as we do that, and as we have opportunity, we do good to all. Even though Jesus did not come to cure sickness and all that list that we spoke of earlier, it doesn't mean that once we have in place the true mission of the church, that we don't care for the sick. We do. We care for the widows, the orphans, the poor, the needy, all of those things. We do good, but the doing good, uh, again, has to be within its proper perspective. The purpose is to exalt Christ and the gospel, his church, and salvation to the world. And as we do that, we do that in love or charity. All right, there are 20 questions posted uh, to the website for lesson number four. Complete those answers and get them emailed to the office by this Friday, Bible at gmail.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come before that throne of grace. Again, thankful, Father, for your great love in sending Jesus to the cross, for his great love in dying for our sins so that we might have hope of eternal life. We're thankful, Father, for the Holy Spirit who's given us your word to teach us the priority of the church, the mission of and purpose of the church as we walk through uh, this world and in this life. We pray, Father, that we might accept the truth of your word, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. We might live lives that are acceptable unto you, and that when this life is over, we can find heaven as our home. Be with us, Father, through this week. Watch over us, care for us in all things, and Lord willing, bring us back at the next appointed time we pray. In Jesus' name, and amen. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time in study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. 
we encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.